Well, today we're talking about uh, back to school. Some principles of what we need to have while we go back to school. Now, you may think, well, I've already graduated from high school. I've graduated from college. I am done with school. Let me ask you, are you done with learning? We always learn. And some of the easiest principles that we need to learn, we have learned or we should have learned before we went to kindergarten. But some of those same principles that if we see our graduates, if we can't do this by the time we graduate from high school or college, we're saying, what good is school? What good is school? I want to give to you uh, uh, something I found on Facebook. My sister sent it to me on Facebook, and, and uh, she has a granddaughter starting school, and, and uh, she thinks it's cute. She, she goes, if you ever need this for a sermon, just use it sometime. So I'm using it today for my sister. Uh, a simple formula for living. And I want to give you these points and see how you're doing on these points. See, as parents, these are the points that we should teach our kids. Our kids, we should establish that these are the principles we want to live by. But when you look at these, on a scale of 1 to 10, each one of them, grade yourself on how you're doing. Because we have to remember our kids not do what we tell them, they do what we show them, right? So let's listen how we're doing. Grade yourself on a scale of 1 to 10. The first one, live beneath your means. Ah, I failed on the very first one. Return everything that you borrow. Stop blaming other people. Admit it when you make a mistake. Give clothes that are not worn to charity. <laughs> you know, being a nonprofit, we, you know, I'll just give that to the church. <laughs> You know, we have a dumpster. You can just throw it away. You don't need to give it to us. Just throw it away so you don't have to throw it away at your house. Because the most stuff that you give to charity is worn out stuff. Do something nice and try not to get caught. Listen more. Talk less. Strive for excellence, not perfection. Be on time and don't make excuses. Don't argue. Get organized. Be kind to unkind people. Let someone cut ahead of you in line. And not get mad. Take time to be alone. Cultivate good manners. Be humble. Realize and accept that life isn't fair. Know when to keep your mouth shut. Somebody give me an amen on that one. <laughs> Go an entire day without criticizing anyone. Learn from the past. Plan for the future. But live in the present. Don't sweat the small stuff. Because it's all small stuff. When you think about those are some things that we all need to live by. There's nothing in there that I shouldn't have taught my kids and there's nothing in there that I shouldn't live by. But when we're going back to school, we're look, looking at what God has for us and at the end of our service today, we're going to bring all of our students in from the children's department. We're going to bring all of our, ask all of our high school students to come up, all of our college students to come up. We're going to ask all the teachers and educators to come on the platform because school is hard. It's tough. It's a different ball game now than it was when I went to school. The competition is real. The emotion is frustration. Sometimes the competition is overwhelming. Kids are tough. And it's different. And as a Christian, as a child of God, going to school just to learn doesn't take place. Our job in the body of Christ and in church is to be an example is to love and is let people know that Christ loves us. So I want to read some scriptures to you found in Psalm chapter 127, verses 1 through 5, and this is written to parents. And uh, this is very important to us. You know, and, and as, a, as a dad, um, I always say this, and our, all of our parents are going to agree with this, you treat my kid with respect, you're respecting me. You hurt my kid, you're hurting me. Moms, somebody says something bad about your little girl, the cat fight is on, right? It's on. But what we have to do is we have to train our kids and love our kids because the school system is not. 
It is our responsibility. I was a youth pastor for many years, and, and one of the things I got frustrated with is parents thinking it was my responsibility to teach all the spiritual values to their students and to, to change the student's life. And I always said, man, I have your students for three hours a week, and you have your students every day. I want to help you, but it's not my responsibility to train your child in every area of life. It is our responsibility as a parent to love our kids and to teach our kids and to live a life in front of them. There's a key word in this first verse. And this key word in this first verse changes everything about what we're talking about. And the key word is build. It is God's job to build. It's our job to allow God to build. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. The idea of a quiver is a, a, a strap that's held on your back that holds your arrows. And the Bible says, happy is the man who has his quiver full of arrows. And our job is to allow that arrow to be pulled from the quiver and to make sure that arrow is straight. To make sure the arrowhead is sharp. It does us no good to have an arrow that does not have a sharp point to it. Nor does it do us any good to have an arrow that is bent. Our job as parents are to make sure the arrows that God has given to us are prepared for life. I've shared this many times, but it's our job as parents. From the time that they are born to the time they leave the nest to train up a child in the way he should go. Our job is to love them, to encourage them. There are going to be very, very difficult days as parents. Our kids are the greatest thing in the world, and they can also be the greatest frustration in the world. But we love them through it all. But it's our job to model this behavior for them. So I want to list a few things to the parents. And then I want to list a few things to the students. Um, just special thoughts, some ideas that we have to be aware of. The first thing is don't depend on the school for moral and spiritual teaching. You can't prepare for it. I, I, I was frustrated uh, a year ago. Uh, my boy went to college. And uh, it was Fort Hay State. And one of the academic deans got up and spoke at the convocation. And he said something that, uh, that, that I, I, when, when I heard it, it was okay. But the more I thought about it, it was frustrating to me. He said this. Courtney, you're going to remember this. Um, he said, your student comes to us with a canvas that is blank. Our job as the educators of this fine institution is to teach your child everything. It is like we're taking a bucket of paint and throw it on the canvas. And that paint will cover that campus. And sometimes it'll fall off. And sometimes we have to throw multiple cans of paint upon that canvas. And when your child graduates from this institution, he will be totally prepared for life. I mean, you know, that sounds good. But Dick Slice, raise your hand, Dick. Dick Slice said something to me. You remember what he said to me? <laughs> You're not sure what you said. Here's what he said. He goes, Bruce, your son did not go to Fort Hay State University with a blank canvas. Your son had the principles of Christ already in his life. And the principles that you put in his life is more important than the education they put upon that campus. Isn't that true? Thank you, Dick. I appreciate what you said there. And I said, I'm the preacher. I'm, I'm supposed to say those good things. But that is so true. Parents, what we have is we have that canvas. And before our kids go to college and before the, the education system that is anti-God gets a hold of our kids, our kids have to be firmly planted in what God has for them, not what an education system has for them. Thank God for education. 
It's a very good thing. But education does not change the spiritual condition of our soul. That is what our job is, to love those kids. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words I command you, you shall love, these I command you shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk to them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them in your sign of your hands, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost and your house and on your gates. Wherever we are, we need to teach our kids. It's not the school system. It's our, hand. It's our family. It's our life. But we have to stop there. And we can't go any further until we get this done. And the first part of that is this. You, mom and dad, shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. I said last week that being married in a marriage is the hardest thing you'll ever do. Somebody give me an amen on that. Anybody that's married, you say that's true. But I said this also. Being a parent is the second hardest thing you'll ever do. It is hard. And it doesn't stop when they're kindergarten. It doesn't stop when they're graduating from high school. It continues on in life. Here's uh, my favorite proverb. It doesn't matter what you teach them. They will grow up just like you. It doesn't matter. They're going to grow up doing what they see, not what they are told. If we don't look for the first part, love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your heart, and with all your mind, what happens? We give them rules to live by, boundaries to live within, and here's what happens. They just dispense religion, rules, and regulations. And when we as parents dispense rules, religion, and regulation, do you know what the kids give us back? Rebellion. Without love, without honesty, without transparency, you go to church, you do your best, you do this without loving them and caring for them. What happens is rebellion takes place, and rebellion takes place. There's no unity. There's no love in the home. It starts in the home. It doesn't start in school. The school is not going to give them spiritual foundation. The second point is don't compare your child's progress with the siblings. Your kids are different, right? Every child is different. For you formed my inner parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knoweth very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in the books they were all written. The days were fashioned for me when you were yet none of them. God knows who we are. He created us uniquely. And that's why I love about, we can't judge, we can't, look at and raise one person the way we have to look at the soul of that individual and in Proverbs chapter 22 train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old he will not depart from it aren't you glad that your parents didn't train you just the way they trained your brother or sister because they're different they're, they're opposites in some cases and sometimes I can look at one of my kids and he'll back off and I look at another kid he'll bow up I thought, dude, you don't want to do this. Yeah, I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, you know, every kid is different. Not only the rights and the wrongs, but also the positives and the negatives. Sometimes that high-strung child gets on your nerves. Oh, he's going to be a leader someday. But then you may have also a child that has low self-esteem. What do you do with that child? That child you have to cultivate. You have to love. You have to spend time with. You know, each child is a book that you have to write. And each book is going to be different. And here's what I say to all parents. Enjoy the book. Enjoy the book. I just married a, a young lady, Mariah uh, Lane. Uh, it's writ taller now. But Mariah Lane. And when I became pastor, she was three years old. And she's a 22-year-old lady right now. And she was married last night. 
And as I stood on this platform, I was thinking as I was talking that this little girl was three years old. And now she's 22. And you know how fast that tent? Just like that. Right, Mom? Just like that. Kids will not be kids long. Kids grow up in no time. They look back and you say, oh, they were in diapers and now they're in junior high. Now they're in high school. Man, I'm taking them to college. And my job is to enjoy that child. My job is to teach that child and enjoy that child in every step of the way. There's valleys. There's hurts and there's pains. But just because one child is successful in this area of life does not mean that child has to be successful in every area of life. Which leads me to the third point. Teach them to do the best, yet leaving, leaving room for failure. Failure. I think most times we learn more when we are hurting than when we are successful. Sometimes the things that we fail at hurt us, but we learn more about them. When kids or students fail, they're not failures. There's a book called Failing Forward. And it tells us that every one of us will fail miserably in areas of our life. There's days that we feel like nothing works. But we never give them an opportunity to think that they are a failure. Because they made a failure in one area of life. They have to pick something up. They have to learn from that. They have to grow up. And sometimes when we look at that, we, we never give them any room for failure. If, if they do something wrong, they get yelled at and cursed at. We need to love them during the weak times. Because we've all failed at something. Never anyone bats a thousand. Sometimes if you bat 333, you're doing really good in the, in the, in the major leagues. And that's only hitting the ball once every three times out of every ten. So what we have to do is we have to love God. Just because somebody thinks that you're a failure doesn't mean that you're a failure. Just because somebody doesn't think that you're good doesn't mean that you're not good. That means maybe they have a different opinion. We have to always, always teach our kids to do their best. But if somebody thinks that they have failed, never allow them to be a failure. And then parents, the fourth, keep in check the over principle. <laughs> the over principle. The first one is over protected. Somebody give me an amen. Sometimes we overprotect our kids. How about over control? How about overindulge? I didn't have it as a child, so I'm going to let them have everything that they want. What about over liberate? The kids control everything in the home. What about over react? Sometimes we have to put in check the over principles. And as a parent, what we have to do is we have to love them. We have to look at my issue, and we call that being self-aware. Sometimes we have to protect our kids, absolutely. But we can't be overly protective. Sometimes we have to control what they do. But you know what? There's going to be a day that they're not in your home. And what you have taught them, they have to live by. And overindulge. The first point of the point was live beneath your means. If our students get everything that they want they're going to get everything they can get even if they can afford it or not and sometimes it's our responsibility as parents to say a word that we don't want to say sometimes to our kids anybody know what that word is no no I'll give you an illustration I have a guy we have a lot of guys come to the church ask for money a lot um, and <laughs> my financial secretary gives me this button it's a no button because I, I have a hard time saying no. So she gives me a no button and she pushes this no button. Say no, say no, say no. So I have a hard time saying no. So I'm saying yes, but here's what you need to do. I need you to go out to the parking lot and I need you to scrape weeds and I'll pay you seven bucks an hour, whatever the case is. And a lot of them come out there and they say, sure, they'll do it. And they get in their truck and they pull off. <laughs> but I had this guy, he said yes. And he did the work. And when he did the work, I, I gave him some money because I have a hard time saying no. But here's the principle of that. Sometimes it's okay to say yes, but not without difficulty. 
Sometimes it's okay to say, you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. But if you would do this, I will give you this. As an employer or employee, don't you have to do that to get a paycheck? And sometimes our students need to learn that to get something, they have to do something. And sometimes we have to understand that we cannot give them everything. Sometimes we have to say no. Sometimes we do. And then fifth one is maintain a home security. Maintain a home security. Make your home a place where your kids want to bring their friends. Make your place some place that is secure. It's fun. Oh, there's rules and there's regulations and there's things that they have to do. But make sure that when your daughter or your son brings somebody to your house, that they want to meet you. They're proud to say, this is my dad or this is my mom. They're proud because sometimes if they go to their home, they get yelled at. And when they go to your home, that's a Christian home, that brings an environment of godliness, make sure it is a fun place. You know, the prodigal son left his dad's house. And he went off and lived a crazy life. Lost everything he had through righteous living. And the Bible says one thing. When he came to himself... When he understood what he had done, he went back to his dad. And his dad opened up his arms and loved him. But do you remember the other side of that story? The older brother. The older brother was in the field and he was mad that his brother came home. And the father went out to the older brother and said, Do you not understand? Your brother was lost and now he's found. He was broke. And now he's back. And his older brother goes, I have been here my entire life. Nobody's celebrating me being here. And that is sometimes what we have to look at as our kids. We have good kids. And they may have never done anything wrong. But sometimes we may have a rebellious child. And we have to love them. We have to train them. We may have to discipline them. But it has to be a home of security. When they come back, they are loved. Nothing motivates more than encouragement. Nothing. Uh, I could remember many years ago when I played baseball. Uh, don't laugh. It was many, many years ago. But um, The difference between a good game and a bad game. My dad would encourage me when I did something great. When I hit a ball, when I pitched a good game. But man, that drive home was terrible when I had a bad game. He would tell me for the 30 minute drive home everything that I've done wrong. Every pitch that I hit, every bat that I didn't hit, or every ball that I didn't hit, he would jump on me all the way home. You know what, I hated driving home with him on my bad games. But I loved driving home with him when I did something good. And I was thinking that to my kids. I said, I want my boy to love driving home with me when he did something good or when he did something bad. Sure, am I going to critique? <laughs> oh, yeah. But after that critique, I'm going to tell him what he did right. Maintain a good security. Listen to this. If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a decision that we make. It's an opportunity that we have. Okay, parents, I want to give three things to your kids. Number one, to all the students, pay attention to all authority. When we gain respect for authority, what happens is the authority respects us. We see that in our culture today, don't we? If we do not respect authority, authority is against us. But when we humbly respect that authority, whether it's our homes, whether it's our teachers, or whether it's even the police, when we respect the position that is over us, God takes care of us. And this principle is found in Proverbs chapter 1. My son, hear the instructions of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother for they will be graceful ornaments on your head and chains about your neck when we respect those that are ahead of us. God will take care of us. And I heard this story of a, 
a boy that came home from school and his dad got home from work about 4.30 and the boy said, uh, Dad, um, they want to know if you want to go to a small meeting after school tomorrow. And the dad says, Oh, you know, I don't really have time to volunteer and they're going to ask me to do all kinds of different things. I'm, I'm good at a lot of different things. So if I say yes to this, they're going to say a bunch of different things. So, uh, Son, I really can't go to that small meeting tomorrow. And the boy goes, Yes. And the dad was thinking... Why did he do that? He went into his room just a little bit and goes, Son, that small meeting tomorrow, what organization is that? And the dad, the boy looked at him and said, Well, that small meeting is me, you, and the principal. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we have to respect authority. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it's the king or in supreme. Make sure we respect all authority. In Ephesians 6.1 it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You know, there's a phrase in there that whether your parents are good or they're bad parents, it doesn't change the fact that you have to respect that authority because of one phrase, three words. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It's the same thing as in marriage. We don't do marriage because sometimes I love my wife or sometimes I love my husband. We are obeying to our husbands and wives because God has given to that responsibility to us. And as parents, as kids, we have to only obey all the time. And then seven, don't give in to peer pressure. Don't give in to peer pressure. What does that mean? It means just don't do everything everybody else wants you to do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. If nothing else, bad friends will get you into trouble. And at school, we understand that who you hang with is who, who you're going to be like. And uh, there's a couple quotes I want to give to you. The first one is Benjamin Franklin says this, He that lies down with dogs shall rise with fleas. All right? If you don't want to cuss, don't hang around with people that cuss. If you don't want to drink, don't go to the bars. It's very simple. What you do is when you're around people that do it. And then George Washington said this. Associate with men of good quality. If you esteem your own reputation. For it is better to be alone than in a bad company. It's better to be alone than in a bad company. My son, in Proverbs 1.10 it says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If sinners entice you, do not consent. See, if we're no different than every other student, then we can do whatever we want to do. But if we, godly followers of Jesus Christ, if we are on a different level because Christ saved us and we want to honor him and we are Christ-like ones, we cannot be enticed with sin because if we do, we lose our testimony. What happens is do not consent. Sometimes we have to make decisions. Whether they like it or not, we have to make decisions of what God really wants us to do. I heard a little story, and it's a true story, about a little fly. A little fly was flying around, and, and he was lonely, and he was, he was kind of, you know, feeling bad about himself. He just wanted other flies to fly with him. And, and he looked down at the ground, and there was a dance floor down on the floor, and it was a brown dance floor, and all these flies were just dancing with one leg on this dance floor. And he looked at it and he said, they're having a good time down there. And he got down right beside the dance floor and he got on the dance floor with all the other flies that couldn't move and they found out that he was stuck on tape. And the flies that were dancing around were not dancing because they were having a good time. They were dancing around trying to get off the dance floor. And sometimes when we get stuck in sin... We're just like that fly. We're looking for somebody to love us, to respect us, to have a good time with us. But once we swoop down, we get stuck in our sin. And sometimes that sin that we get stuck in could absolutely kill us. And we could take our joy and take our freedom. We can't allow the sin of this world to stick us. We have to love them. And then the last one. Make Christ the Lord of your life. Make Christ the Lord of your life. It, it would be different if you were not Christian. 
But making the Lord of your life doesn't mean be a follower of Jesus Christ. Because you're already there. Making him the Lord of your life means every decision that you make is about him. Every place that you go is about him. The conversations that you have is about him. You don't have to be religious. You don't have to be full of piety. But the decisions that you make has to be one, I want God to be glorified. I, I don't want to go someplace where God could be hindered and I could fall apart. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give the defense to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. It's not about taking the Bible and telling everybody how great, how spiritual, and how wonderful you are. And how much Bible you know. It's about telling people with meekness and fear in your life. Just saying, you know what, I just know what I did. I know I went to camp this year and I know I gave my life to Christ. And I know I'm going to church and I, I'm just trying to, trying to be different. Sometimes we just have to put Christ where he needs to be. And if I put the flesh in charge of Christ, I'm going to fail every day. I'm going to fail. Somebody tell me you wouldn't. I mean, we all do. So what we have to do is we have to know, being self-aware of where I fail, and put guards, guardrails up. So if I walk up that edge, I know, I know I'm weak in that area. I know that's a temptation of mine. So if I flirt with that temptation long enough, I'm going to reach over and I'm going to play with that temptation. But if I stay away... I don't need to go to the bar. I don't need to go do that. Because I want to put Christ where he needs to be within my life. Some of the most important decisions that you make is not at school. It's not at your house. It's not even at church. Some of the most important decisions that you make when you're by yourself. And you and you alone know where you're weak. And you know what you need to do. And you have to purpose in your heart in the times of difficulty, when you're going to school and your friends are asking you to do something wrong, when you're out of school and they want to go to a party on Friday night, you have to make a decision in your head. Am I going to make Christ a priority within my life? It's either me or him. And I want Christ to be the honored in every area of my life. School is hard. Going back to school is tough. Your friends are going to be there. It's going to be hard. It's going to be fun. But purpose in your heart that my decision is I'm going to be a follower of Christ first. And then I can be a friend. I can be an athlete. I can do whatever I want after. But my first priority is to follow Christ. Now I'm going to ask something very special. I'm going to ask all of our, our, our students. If you are in elementary school, if you're in high school, if you're in junior high, if you're in college, if you're continuing education in any area, I would like for you to come forward. And if you're an educator, if you're any education, whether you're a para, whether you're a, a, a teacher, in any form of education, I want to ask you to come forward as well. And just come all the way across the front here. Look at this missionary team that we have right here, right? Isn't this awesome? All these students from kindergarten through college, whether they're educators or whether they're students, they're going back to school either last week or this week. Do you think they need our prayer? It is very important for them to know that the church has their back. That mom and dad has their back. I'm going to ask Justin to sing just a couple verses of a song. And while he's singing, I want to ask you just to pray. Just to pray for one of these students. And then I'm going to ask Josh to come up 
and uh, have a time of prayer over these students. But let's sing this song and pray for each one of these kids. If you know them by name, call them by name. Students, just bow your heads. And let's have a time of prayer for a couple minutes over back to school with our students. Thank you. 